I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations in the name of our Lord. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. Here's my coffee. And I am your caffeine-imbued host, Page. And today, we are going to be looking at Exodus 39. And we'll probably be spending a couple days on this chapter. Um, Alex, I guess the reason for that would be is that I was really struck with uh, this one concept, this one thought that's been banging around inside my skull. Since the writer of Hebrews tells us that the tabernacle and things associated with it are a picture, um, an analogy, if you will, or a, or a allegory, that'd be a good word for it, of the true tabernacle in heaven, and that the writer of Hebrews obviously wasn't referring to just the physical construction, saying that heaven looks like a giant tent with a bunch of animal skins around it, um, but that the function of the tabernacle is what we are to be looking at and observing to see how heaven works. Um, then all things associated with the tabernacle are there for a picture for us to draw from to figure some things out about how we're to relate with God because the end game for the tabernacle was God relating with his people Israel and how Israel related with their God through the tabernacle. That was a vehicle that God chose. So when we look at the tabernacle, the different items in it, they mean something. The lampstand means something. The table of showbread means something. The... Uh, Altar of incense means something. The bronze laver means something. The bronze altar means something. The mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant, they all mean something. Well, today we're going to be looking at the clothes that the priests wear. And exactly what is that a picture of? So let's get started. Let's just read it. And then uh, we're going to discuss one of three things today. There's the priests have three functions within the uh, sphere of the tabernacle. One, the priests will minister to the non priests, they'll meet the non priests and they will meet their needs. They represent the non priest to God and they represent God to the non priests. That's one function. And we're going to talk about that function today. The second function of those priests was that they ministered to other priests inside the tent of meeting, inside the holy place. And uh, we'll talk about that probably tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, we'll look at how the priests minister to God. What do the priests do? And how? what does that look like? What does that mean? How does that translate into your life, my life, as believers before God today. Now, please know that when this is a devotional, and a devotional is me thinking on what God is saying and looking for application into my life. I, I, I want to be one of those real-life rubber-meets-the-road Christians that doesn't just subscribe to a theory of Christianity, that doesn't just subscribe to the idea of a God or the idea of a Christianity. I want to live my life in such a way that there is no doubt 
that I have relationship with God. And underlying all of this, you remember in the New Testament when I said that the overlying message of the New Testament was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors yourself? Jesus said, upon these two commandments rest all the law and the prophets, right? That's the overlying message of the New Testament. The overlying message of the Old Testament, at least so far from me, has been the fact that the Ten Commandments is more like a marriage contract than a list of do's and don'ts. Hero Israel, I am the Lord your God. Now, if I am truly the Lord your God and we have a relationship, you and I, then you won't commit adultery, you won't murder, you won't have idols, you won't cheat, you won't covet. You'll honor your mother and father. You'll you see how that works? These things flow out of relationship. I was a different man before I met and fell in love with my wife. As a result of falling in love with my wife and marrying her and starting a life with her, my life changed. The want to in my heart changed. There were a lot of things that changed because I was married to her. The last thing in the world I want to do is offend that woman. The last thing I want to do is to hurt that woman. So as a result of being married to my wife, there are no other women in my life. As a result of being married to my wife, my behavior changed in a lot of significant areas, but it's based on my love for her. I didn't change these things to earn her approval so that she would marry me. I fell in love with her and saw that I needed to change if I wanted this woman in my life. And so I changed, but that change came from the foundation of my love for my wife. That's kind of what's happening in the Old Testament here. If I am the Lord your God and you have and I have a relationship, then as a result, this is what that looks like. So I'm couching everything so far within that framework in the Old Testament. Just like in the New Testament, the Jesus' two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbors yourself. All the epistles are the are the writers saying, this is what that looks like fleshed out. Loving God looks like this in the context of the New Testament church. Serving your neighbor looks like this in the context of the New Testament church. In the Old Testament, if you really love God, this is what that looks like. That's kind of where I'm coming from with this. So let's get started. Let's look at Exodus 39. We'll read it and Today, we'll look at the first concept of what serving unbelievers looks like. All right, let's see here. Chapter 39. From the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary. They also made sacred garments for Aaron, as the Lord commanded Moses. They made the ephod of gold and blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen. They hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, the work of skilled hands. They made shoulder pieces for the ephod, which were attached to two of its corners so that it could be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband was like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen as the Lord commanded Moses. They mounted the onyx stones in gold filigree settings and engraved them like a seal with the names of the sons of Israel. Then they fastened them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. They fashioned the breast piece, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made it like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen. It was square, a span long, a span wide, with and folded double. Then they mounted four rows of precious stones on it, The first row was carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row was turquoise, lapis lazuli, and emerald. The third row was jacinth, agate, and amethyst. The fourth row was topaz, onyx, and jasper. They were mounted in gold filigree settings. There were 12 stones, 
one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. For the breastpiece, they made braided chains of pure gold like a rope. They made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings and fastened the rings to two of the corners of the breastpiece. They fastened the two gold chains to the rings at the corners of the breastpiece and the other ends of the chains to the two settings, attaching them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. They made two gold rings and attached them to the other two corners of the breastpiece on the inside edge next to the ephod. Then they made two more gold rings and attached them to the bottom of the shoulder pieces on the front of the ephod close to the seam just above the waistband of the ephod. They tied the rings of the breastpiece to the rings of the ephod with blue cord, connecting it to the waistband so that the breastpiece could not swing out from the ephod as the Lord commanded Moses. They made the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth, the work of a weaver, with an opening in the center of the robe like the opening of a collar and a band around this opening so that it would not tear. They made pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen around the hem of the robe and they made bells of pure gold and attached them around the hem between the pomegranates. The bells and pomegranates alternated around the hem of the robe to be worn for ministering as the Lord commanded Moses. For Aaron and his sons, they made tunics of fine linen, the work of a weaver, and the turban of fine linen, the linen caps, and the undergarments of finely twisted linen. The sash was made of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, the work of an embroiderer, as the Lord commanded Moses. They made the plate, the sacred emblem, out of pure gold and engraved on it, like an inscription on a seal, holy to the Lord. Then they fastened a blue cord to it to attach to the turban, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, Note I found here, all the garments worn by the Old Testament priests were symbolic of being set apart for God's work of atoning for sin. That's the end game of the priest, to bring the non-priest into reconciliation with God. Compliance with this dress code was required. Uh, you see it in, in uh, chapter 28, 43. It says, Aaron and his sons must wear the garments whenever they enter the tent of meeting, or approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they will not incur guilt and die. While such elaborate garments may seem odd today, God used these distinctive garments to set his spiritual leaders apart from the other Israelites. Each piece of the priestly garments held significance related to the work the priest performed. The Israelites lived with a continual reminder of the importance of the priestly work. They also had a foreshadowing of Jesus, the great high priest, who would carry out God's plan of atonement in true holiness and perfection. The priests were set apart by God from the non-priests. And it would be very easy to distinguish a priest from the non-priest by the clothes they were wearing when they were in service to God. So now, Moses inspects the tabernacle. All the work in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. The Israelites did everything, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, all its furnishings, its clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, bases, the covering of ramskins dyed red, and the covering of another durable leather, and the shielding curtain, the Ark of the Covenant law with its poles and the atonement cover, the table with all its articles and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its row of lamps and all its accessories, the olive oil for the light, the gold altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, and the curtain for the entrance to the tent, the bronze altar with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the ropes and tent pegs for the courtyard, all the furnishings for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons when serving as priests. The Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. All right. As I mentioned before, there are three arenas of service for these priests. One, service to the non-priest. Two, service to fellow priests. 
and three, service to God. Today, I'm just going to be sharing some thoughts. And again, please don't forget, devotion, the purpose of a devotional Bible study for me is my thinking with my mouth open. And that's what you're getting to get access to. I'm not presenting this and would never even presume to present this as a biblical scholar. I'm just a man who's reading the scripture and looking for application. I want my life to be different. I want my life to be substantially different a year from now than it is right now. I want to be more like God a year from now than I am right now. I can look back and I can tell you that my life is substantially and qualitatively different than it was 10 years ago. And as I read these passages of scripture, they're not just words to me. So I'm going to, be, I'm going to obey the Psalm 1 where it says, blessed is the man who delights, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night. I'm going to mutter to myself. I'm going to think to myself. That's what I'm doing here. And the question I'm asking myself is, what is the importance of the priests in the tabernacle? And how does that relate to us? Hebrews says the tabernacle, the function of the tabernacle and everything with it is a picture of how heaven works, a picture of how God relates to his people. Well, Peter says in his epistles that we are considered a kingdom of priests. So the priests in this picture, that's us. And the first thing that comes to mind is that when we are serving as priests, and we are, the minute you bowed your knee to him, you became a priest in the kingdom of God. If you're serving as a priest, there must be something about you that is distinctively different from the non-priests. And I'm not saying it has to be the clothes you wear. I'm not saying it has to be, there has to be a qualitative something about you that sets you apart. Non-priests had no problem identifying who the priests were, who the Levites were. They could see the clothes they were wearing. My first thought is, what can, what sets me apart to the point where the world around me sees me as something different? I shared this story before. Uh, when I was at my getting my grad degree in music composition, how a friend of mine who was an atheist Oh, by the way, I have friends who are atheists. I have friends in the gay community. I have friends who drink too much. I have some friends who are uh, definitely not Christian. I have friends who believe differently in religion than I do. Now, I don't hang out with all of them. I don't embrace their lifestyle but I'm still their friend. And this atheist friend of mine, who, by the way, as of, as of this morning, uh, actually as of a couple of years ago now, he's no longer an atheist. He came down to breakfast and saw me sitting with some friends of mine who are gay. And he, that stunned him. He said, I thought Christians hated gay people. He told me that later. I said, no, I don't hate gay people. I don't hate anybody. Hatred's a waste of time. He said, yeah, but... I said, yeah, all right, if I don't agree with their lifestyle, I don't think it's God's best for them. But that doesn't preclude me being a friend to them and being accessible to them or anybody that is different than I am. I can still be their friend. And... That was an amazing thought to him. And that began a series of conversations which ended up resulting in him getting hold of me one day and says, I can't consider myself an atheist anymore. There's too much going on that I have to attribute to God. So, and I'm not saying that all to brag on myself, but I like to think that's what sets me apart, that I am not a Christian who is against anything. I'm a Christian that's for God. 
And I try to let that filter out into my day-to-day living. You don't have to be around me very long before you discover that I'm a Christian, that I believe in a God who redeems, who saves, who heals. Um, Whether you agree with that or not, I guarantee you that it's not going to be long before you hear in my speech and in my mannerisms that I am filled with the joy of the Lord. Um, So I'm looking at these priests and what sets them apart? It's not, for the priest today, for you and I, it's not the clothes we wear necessarily. Um, Well, you shouldn't wear you know, sexually suggestive clothing, perhaps. But it's not the externals. If you're in a relationship with God, your relationship with others around you will be different. In today's cancel culture, it seems like the uh, modus operandi is if, if somebody doesn't agree with you, they, they assess that as... Um, Hatred. If I don't agree with their point of view, they think I hate. And they will set out, the cancel culture will set out to cancel you. If you own a store and you don't cater to gay weddings like that bakery did, and the whole community rise, you know, that whole community rose up against them. A lot of people around the United States rose up against them. And shut that business down. That's, if you don't agree, that's hatred. The Christian should not be that. We're not part of the cancel culture. I don't believe in boycotts. I don't believe in getting other Christians together to shut down anybody's business. Um, now, I may not frequent that business, but they have a right to have a business. Anybody has a right to have a business if that's what they want to do. So my participation as a priest in today's world has everything to do with how I relate to God and how that flows out of my life into the world around me. Now here, service to the non-priest, this first point. Three arenas of service for these priests. A priest meets the needs of the non-priest. This wasn't service just for service's sake. The end game of the service was reconciliation with God. So just throwing money in the offering plate, um, dropping clothes off at a homeless shelter, good things. But if that's the extent of your service, then you're missing the point. The end game of the service was reconciliation with God. That's going to require relationship. That's going to require interacting with the non-priests in your periphery. Our lives of meeting the needs of non-priests, that is unbelievers within the periphery of our lives, has an end game, reconciliation with God. That's going to involve your involvement with those folks. Now, that includes providing food. Um, That includes um, providing clothing, shelter, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, provides a perfect example. What what did that Jewish man need that was beaten up and lying injured in that ditch? He needed medical care. He needed a place to live to recover so he could recover. Um, that wasn't the time to debate the Samaritan versus pure blood Jewish believers systems. You know, apparently the Samaritans had a temple that they they went to. Um, that wasn't the time for religious discussion. The man needed medical help, and so medical help was given. And that Samaritan was significantly different than other Samaritans of the community he came from. Um, So much so that he was the hero of that story, not the Jewish man, which you would expect a Jewish parable would have a Jewish man as a hero. Look how he cared for the poor Samaritan. Now, in that story, the Samaritan was the hero. The Samaritan was loving his neighbor. That was Jesus' point. They said, who's your neighbor? He says, whoever is in need around you. 
the Christian who is has God dwelling in his heart and who is in relationship with God will be compelled to be different, will be compelled to serve and meet the needs of the non-priests with the end game of reconciling them to God because that's what the priests did in the tabernacle. The non-priest would bring a sacrifice. They'd hand it over to the priest and the priest would take that sacrifice representing the non-priest and sacrifice it to God on behalf of the non-priest. And then he would pronounce God's blessings on the non-priest, therefore, thereby representing God to the non-priest. So we don't hide who we are. We, we don't hide in the shadows. We don't lurk. We, we don't run away from the spotlight. As a believer, you are called to be distinctively different in your lifestyle, in the words you speak. And according to the Ten Commandments, if you have a relationship with God, these should be things that should be flowing out of you. And if those things don't flow out of your life, you need to have a talk with God about that. I'm not calling you to be perfect. I'm not. But I will say this, my life is substantially different this year than it was last. Way different than it was when I first bowed my knee to him in 1975. So the realm of service, this first realm of service, is service to the non-priest, to the unbelievers. And that service can take lots of different looks. There's no uh, handbook on, this is how you serve a non-priest. This is how you serve an unbeliever. You look for opportunity and you take advantage of that opportunity. To some, you know, Jesus said, I think in one of the gospels, Day of Judgment, he's he's talking to one group of people and he said, uh, depart from me, you wicked, to the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And they said, he said, I don't know you. But they said, but Lord, we, we prophesied in your name. We healed. We taught. We did all these Christian things. We did all these believers type things. But he's going to say, but I never knew you. These were people who were caught up in doing the churchy things, uh, the visible, highly visible churchy things. And Jesus says, but I, I never knew you. He turns to the other group of people and says, enter now into the joy of the Lord. Uh, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. You gave me shelter. And they said, but Lord, when did we do any of these things to you? He said, when you did it to the least of these did it unto me. Service to others is rendered as service to God. If you're in right relationship with God, you're focused on the people in your life and your service is to them. I, there's a lot more things we could go to, to expand on this, but I hope that plants a seed or two of think of thought and that you give some thought to the fact that we are called to be priests and we are called to represent God to the non-priest and represent the non-priest to God. One last thought. The priest was not commanded to go out and find the non-priest that needed sacrifices. He wouldn't go out into the camp, into a person's house says, you need to come to the altar and bring a bring a sheep with you, or bring your first fruits. He, he wouldn't do that. He ministered at the altar and those who came were ministered to. This is not a call for us to go out and browbeat the community around us in the name of Jesus. That's not service. This is a call to meet the needs of those who are coming to you for various reasons. Those who are in your periphery that God has you in contact with, you don't have to look for anybody to meet their needs. There's people all around you. Look to that. 
All right. That's enough for this, I think. Um, if I go too far in this, it, it starts to become very, very legalistic, and I, I really want to avoid that. I'm just caught up in the thought of what service to the non-priest should look like today. And this is still developing in me. But I hope there's enough here for you to think on. Have a great day. Here's my coffee. I'm Paige, and I am out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You know, a few closing thoughts. Um, the tendency is to take something like what I've been talking about, service to the non-priest, and turn it into a set of rules that says serving the non-priest in your life looks like this. Do this and you'll meet the requirements. It becomes then a list of things to do in order to gain the accolade of being called a believer. And we know that's not how it works. These things flow out of true relationship. But there are those who would make this into a list of rules and demand that God's followers look and do these things. I have a really good friend of mine, dear friend of mine, um, who was really huge on family. Family was everything, he said. And... During all the time he was raising his children, he made a big deal about how important family was and keeping the family together. But then when the kids grew up, they left home, didn't come back. And it was only discovered much later that on the outside, the veneer of family was what he presented to the world. But behind the closed doors of his house, he was mean. He was vindictive. He uh, punished far more strictly and often than he should have. And when it came time to leave the home, the children left the home and didn't go back. He was right. Family is important. But he developed a set of rules so that it appeared to be real, this family relationship. But eventually, when his children grew up and moved out of the house... They had no compulsion to go back to that house. And he's a sad man now because he wasn't truly in relationship with his children like he should have been. Now, in my family, my children have grown up to become my wife and I's best friends. We adore them. and Every chance we get together with them is an event full of joy. Our relationship with our children, the way they are now, is a result of our relationship with them as they were growing up. Our family was very important to us. And it was expressed through relationship. And I will say about my friend, whose life is very sad right now, He didn't have that at his house. So please know that all of this that I'm going to be talking about in the next several days has to flow out of a relationship with God. You have to have an ongoing, vital relationship with God for any of this to make any real sense or have any real value or have any real impact in the lives of those people around you. Relationship with God is vital. I'll talk to you some more about that tomorrow. Bye-bye.